Live from KSAT 12, the 6 o'clock news starts right now. I will announce next week the plan for the state of Texas to begin building the border wall in the state of Texas. Governor Greg Abbott making that very announcement in Del Rio just moments ago this evening, talking about plans he has to address the surge of migrants we've seen recently along the U.S.-Mexico border, including signing an executive order. Our Jonathan Cotto is in Del Rio. He was at the governor's announcement. We'll check in with him in a, for, in a few minutes, but first. We want to move now to an update on a story involving a house that seems to have been intentionally destroyed. We've been digging into this to find out why, and we've learned that house is at the heart of a complicated legal mess. Yeah, whatever the reason, neighbors say it's a dangerous eyesore. Jesse Deguiato has been following this story. She joins us live from that house on Stormy Sky. Jesse, give us the very latest. Well, what you see here will look much differently come Monday. The city is hiring a contractor to make sure of it. Its ultimate fate is yet to be decided, but at least neighbors say it'll be much safer than it is now. It's crazy. Look at that, Jack. Courtney Green even brought her kids by to look at the house that she had to see for herself. She agrees it looks destroyed. Roof, windows, siding, torn off, debris everywhere. Code enforcement has posted a stop work order, usually given when there's no permit. Utilities have been shut off. A city spokesperson says everything should be cleaned up and secured by the end of this weekend. Whether it's repaired or possibly demolished will be up to the Building Standards Board next month. The next door neighbor who took the photo of a worker using a chainsaw on the roof says he thinks they should start from the ground up. Build a new home here for someone to come in and uh, keep the neighborhood looking nice. Whatever happens from here on out, neighbors say they're just relieved the city is doing something about it. I think that's a very good thing uh, for safety for the, the neighborhood and the kids. Absolutely it needs to be taken care of. It's going to make it much better. At least somebody is tracking it and get it taken care of as quickly as possible. I'm going to let it go through the process, see where it goes through with uh, code compliance and development services, and uh, we'll see where it goes. But I, I have complete faith in them. They'll work it through the process as it should be. Well, neighbors say whatever led up to all this should not have resulted in a beautiful 3,000 square foot home with six bedrooms being left in shambles. We're live on the northeast side. Jesse De Guillado, KSAT 12 News. We'll follow it. Thank you, Jesse. One person has been arrested in connection with an apartment complex fire that left 20 people without a home this evening. The flame sparked just before four this morning at the Bricks Terrell Hills Apartments. That's off Harry Wurzbach Road, not far from Riddiman and Eisenhower Road. When fire crews got there, they say they saw heavy flames coming from the roof of the building. Part of that roof collapsed. A tenant there says this was a scary morning. Grab my pants and my shirt and put my shoes. Only thing I can say is thank God for Jesus and I'm still alive. A total of 12 units were damaged on a second floor here. The Red Cross is helping families displaced by this fire as this investigation continues. $100,000 in damage done by flames to a home on the northeast side of the city. Firefighters called to the 7200 block of Glen Cross near Gibbs Sprawl and Walsham Road. Fire crews say two people escaped the house before they arrived. One of them had to go to the hospital for an underlying health issue. The weather playing a part in the fight with extra crews called in to help. No one was injured in the fire. San Antonio police taking another shot at finding some witnesses or anyone who can help them with some information on a deadly attack at Brackenridge Park. Officers say 65 year old Juan Apolinar Jr was seated at a picnic table with serious injuries when they found him back on April 25th. He was taken to the hospital where he later died. Investigators believe he was the victim of an attack, and even though there were several people at the park, police couldn't find any witnesses. Information that leads to an arrest in connection with this case could be worth a cash reward from Crime Stoppers. You can call the number on your screen. Well, actually, this is the number to call. It's not on your screen. 210-224-STOP. Now back to Governor Greg Abbott's announcement today. Some major moves he is making to address the recent surge of migrants at the border. He is again in Del Rio right now, where he just signed an executive order that he says will help protect landowners, stop people from crossing illegally, 
and arrest those smuggling drugs and people into Texas. Yeah, the governor signing that order in front of law enforcement officials, county judges and people who live near or on the border. Also, there are Jonathan Cloto who joined us live with more on what the governor is promising. Jonathan. That's right, Steve. I'm right outside the Del Rio Civic Center where just moments ago that summit was taking place. The governor says a lot of the challenges border communities are facing are a direct result of the open border policy that's in place right now. He also said the removal of the Remain in Mexico policy has contributed to an increase of migrant crossings, creating unsafe neighborhoods. Fences are being mowed down. You have livestock and crops that are being destroyed. You have homes that are being invaded in neighborhoods that simply are not as safe as they used to be. Law, law enforcement, your law enforcement officers, they're having to redirect their resources to deal with the border as opposed to deal with what they normally deal with, which is keeping your community safe every day. A change is needed was the very present theme here at the summit. Abbott also signing into action a governor's task force to better secure the border. That task force including a $1 billion allocation for border security. And as you heard, the governor plans on announcing next week his plans to build that wall, but he didn't detail exactly how that, that wall will be paid for. You can expect a more detailed report tonight at 10. Reporting live from Del Rio, Jonathan Cotto, KSAT 12 News. Thank you, Jonathan. The old Friedrich air conditioning building steeped in San Antonio history. The future of a near east side housing development on the site, though, is up in the air after council members voted to delay a key vote. The decision to delay came after Councilman John Courage raised concerns about whether the Friedrich Lofts project would actually bring affordable housing to the area. Half of the 358 units created in part of the Friedrich complex on East Commerce would be priced below market rate but only 14 of them would be for people earning 60% of the area median income. When I looked at this project uh, a while back, uh, you know, it, it looked like it was heading in a good direction. But the more that I thought about what the community was getting in return, uh, the more I felt there wasn't more pressure we could put on the developers to give us a better product for that community. The outgoing District 2 Councilwoman Jada Andrews Sullivan believes that given all the development in the district, this project is affordable. It will likely be at least August before the issue comes up again. Marijuana is now legal in 36 states for medical purposes and 17 states for recreational use. The Texas legislature just passed a bill to expand the Texas medical marijuana program. But along with the buzz about its calming effects, there are some myths out there, too. Ursula Perry has some stats that you should know about. It's just about everywhere you look, and it's legalized in more states every year. But there's more to the story when it comes to marijuana use. The common misconceptions and attitudes is that marijuana is harmless, which it's not. In fact, according to the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, marijuana contains three to five times the amount of carcinogens as tobacco. And marijuana can lead to permanent IQ loss of as much as eight points if you start at a young age. Studies also link the drug to depression, anxiety, suicide, self-harm, and psychotic episodes. Another myth? It's not addictive. Cannabis use disorder is frequent use of cannabis use and causing significant impairment in functioning. Studies suggest that 30% of those who use marijuana have some degree of cannabis use disorder. And the last fallacy, it's okay to drive with marijuana in your system. Actually, Fontanella says the truth is this drug significantly impairs judgment, motor coordination and reaction time, and it can increase your chances of a car crash. And there's more. The Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration is warning that those who use marijuana tend to have problems with their relationships, low career advancement, as well as educational outcomes that are poor. On the flip side, the CDC says that it can help with chronic conditions. Right now, sitting on Governor Greg Abbott's desk is a bill he could sign that would add veterans with PTSD to the state's medical marijuana program. Ursula Perry, KSAT 12 News. Child drowning is a concern every summer, but this year, maybe more so. 
Swim lessons are starting up again, but last year they were canceled because of the pandemic. Add to that a surge in backyard pool building and consumer advocates say there's a greater risk of water tragedies. Last year in Texas alone, there were 80 child drownings. There have been 25 so far this year, according to the state. The YMCA tells us they are seeing a big demand in swim lessons this year, and they're happy about it because swimming is a survival skill. It's important for kids to know what to do if they ever end up, end up in trouble in the water, but also just learn the basics of floating, jumping in, climbing out to make sure that they are safe. Many child drownings happen because of a gap in adult supervision. A child can silently slip underwater and go unnoticed. Vega encourages using a water watcher strategy where an adult keeps an eye on the kids in the water 100% of the time. Let's take a look outside with live cam this evening. 94 degrees out there, still oh so humid. But Adam, is this the warmest we have been so far this year? Well, actually, you know, that bug's actually not correct right now. Ah, I'll be honest, okay. that's a little off. Um, we're 90 degrees at the airport, and that's our high temperature for the day today. So another day where we're right at 90 degrees in the afternoon, which is pretty close to average for this time of year. Here's the reading from the International Airport in town. 90 degrees, Port SA 89, Randolph 91. Actually, nowhere on this map are we, well, one location, Stinson, 94 degrees, Rio Medina at 88, and some upper 80s in the hill country. This evening, of course, warm out there, very sticky, high humidity in place. By 10 o'clock, still in the lower 80s. Midnight, right near 80 degrees, those increasing low clouds tonight. And overall, we're in a pretty repetitive pattern. There will be some changes as we get into next week, and one part of the Gulf that we're going to keep a close eye on, I'll talk more about that, along with our newest drought monitor coming right up. Thank you, Adam. A bridge replacement project in Bernie on hold because some birds moved in. How long the new tenants are expected to delay things and what locals who are waiting for this new bridge to be constructed feel about it. Next at 6. The snow and rain are gone and mosquitoes are back and they're back with a vengeance. Standing water like this not helping the problem. How the city and county are trying to respond. Got a traffic authority update for you right now. The wait continues for a bridge over I-10 in Bernie to be replaced. Now birds are the latest cause for the delay. Our Samuel King joins us now. Samuel, you touched on this just a little bit yesterday. So what does this mean for this project as a whole? Uh, yes, indeed. TxDOT is assuring us right now that this will not delay things, this bridge demolition, but people in the area are hoping that's the case. We need this. We need this now and faster than ever, really. Javier Acevedo is the service manager at Hill Country Automotive. It's, it's close to the Main Street Bridge over I-10 and close to all the construction work to upgrade the frontage roads. It's kind of diminished the, the traffic that we get through here and now uh, even the routing to get to us is a little bit different. Also different is the timetable to take down this bridge, twice delayed because of weather, now migratory birds are the culprit. Nevertheless, TxDOT says things are still on track. In a statement, it tells us that the bridge work wasn't even supposed to happen until this upcoming December or January. The construction crews found a way to speed up that timetable. Acevedo just hopes the bridge work and the rest of the project wraps up soon. He says traffic is only building in the area as Bernie continues to grow. Well, we've uh, been dealing with this for going on three or four years now since before 2018. We just can't wait for it to be done. We just can't wait. And TxDOT says that construction team is working on mitigation methods in regard to those birds. It's still waiting for a new date on the demolition work. As for this evening's traffic, it looks fine in Bernie, but we've got some big problems in San Antonio, so let's get right to it. Uh, so we'll start here on I-35 at Wiedner. Some two left lanes closed down to nine miles per hour, so that's some big traffic there. Also, I-10 westbound advanced shacks and a couple of crashes here. This is less of a worry uh, than this one. We'll show you that in a second. The lanes are blocked. Showing you our travel times tool this evening and you're seeing the effects that's having. It's taking more than an hour to get from New Braunfels to San Antonio on 35. Also, we have some construction on I-10 coming out of Seguin, so it's taking a little longer than normal coming inbound. We usually don't show this this time of day, but it just gives you an indication. So if you need to head out on I-10 or in town or 35, you might want to hold off a little 
little bit, maybe an hour, a half hour, or 45 minutes. And I promise you we're going to show you these. So here is the situation I-10 Advanced Jackson. You see a couple of lanes blocked there. Most of the traffic there on the frontage road slowed down. And we're going to give you one more look here. Hopefully I pressed the right button. There it is, 35 at Wiener. You see the fire truck there, two left lanes still blocked. We'll have another update on this coming up in the next half hour. Stephen Meyer. All right, thanks, Samuel. All right, Sky 12 out and about, and think about it. One week from today, oh, Fiesta Fiesta, oh, the official kickoff. Goodness. That's right. Of the 2021 Fiesta. The and it's feeling a little more Fiesta-like <laughs> yeah. out there. Yeah, you did, did, yeah. Yeah, remember back in April when we were saying, hey, this would have been Fiesta Fiesta mm -hmm. and even Flambeau, and we had all those showers and thunderstorms, and this is a quiet weather pattern for it meant to be <laughs> i'd say so good confetti weather if you ask me for fiesta fiesta i'm gonna bring like two or three shirts though Ooh. yeah we're gonna Just be because we're gonna be going through shirts we'll be sweating through them that's yes. we're all sweating together we're all in it together so the new drought monitor is in i'm excited to share that with you show you the whole state break it down in terms of numbers slightly warmer temperatures as we get into the weekend and then some minor rain chances ahead as well so let's get to the new drought monitor take a look at this i love the site across our area little to no drought we have pretty much erased it all, especially compared to what it was about a month and a half to two months ago, which I'll show you coming up next half hour. But you look at the state, only 13% of Texas is in drought. That's part of the Western Panhandle and especially West Texas. We're talking Alpine, Marfa, Fort Davis over toward El Paso. That's really the sweet spot where we need the rain now. But you compare it to three months ago, about two thirds of the state was in drought, now only 13%. The aquifer, this is good to see. This is since the start of the year, so since January 1st. There's that dip during the freeze when we had all the power and water issues. We rebounded a bit, and then we got into the spring pumping season, March into April. No rain then until the rains hit us. April on into May, and boom, look at that. Look at that nice rise. We went from stage one to no restrictions, just year year round watering rules still in effect. So 90 degrees now, dew point is 72, so it feels like it's seven, seven degrees warmer than the actual air temperature. Feels like 97 out there. You look across the state, 105 El Paso, that's the hot spot right now. Midland Alpine 99, along with Laredo and Del Rio in the upper 90s, just near the century mark there. 93 Pleasanton, 92 New Braunfels. Actually, temperature is pretty close to average for this time of year, especially in and around San Antonio and surrounding communities as well. You factor in the humidity, feels like 101 in New Braunfels. Pleasanton feels like it's just over 100 in Del Rio. 111 for their feels like temperature when you factor in this humidity. These are the dew points, of course, well into the 70s. We're starting to see slightly lower afternoon dew points today and we'll see that the next couple of days and probably see another rise as we get on into the end of the weekend and early next week. Overall, it's just going to stay pretty sticky outside. It's going to be in the oppressive levels, but minor adjustments downward. I mentioned West Texas. That's where we need the rain the most. We're starting to see another afternoon of a few isolated downpours out there. It's better than nothing. We'll take it. Big Blue H still by and large in control of our weather and this ridge goes all the way up into Nebraska and South Dakota. Now that is going to be pushing off to the north and it's going to open up our door for some disturbances. So starting Monday, a slight chance of rain in the longer term. We're talking beyond next week. We have to just watch this area in the southern Gulf of Mexico as all that moisture is being suppressed by the upper level high, but there is some indications that in the extended range, some of that might start working its way toward us. That would be beyond a week from now. So tomorrow, 75 degrees in the morning, low 90s by the afternoon, about 92, 93 the high, southeasterly wind at 10 to 15. I think we'll be right near 100 along the border tomorrow afternoon for the air temperature, but feeling like it's about 7 to 10 degrees warmer. The weekend, mid 90s, next week, similar temperatures, just some 20% chances every afternoon. All right, thank you, Adam. All right, I think after last year, the Cowboys said, we need to figure out more ways to get this guy on the field, Larry. Yeah, Tony Pollard, he's such a dynamic athlete. And Mike McCarthy recently said that they put him at wide receiver doing OTAs, mainly out of necessity because they were a little thin. But Tony Pollard can catch the ball, and he sounds like he likes doing it too. Plus, two former Jetson football players are named best in the state. Coming up.
<laughs> he's definitely been locked in. You know, I can tell he's, you know, took the right step forward this offseason, you know, getting his body right and getting in shape. And, you know, me and him, you know, we also worked out together a lot of times during the offseason. So, you know, we both were locked in this offseason getting, getting ready. Tony Pollard says Ezekiel Elliott is looking good entering his sixth NFL season in big board sports. Pro football coverage powered by Davis Law Firm. Last season was Zeke's worst in the NFL on the ground with 979 yards, averaging just four yards per carry, both career lows for the two-time NFL rushing champion, and he lost a career high four fumbles. That, on top of the Cowboys' 6-10 and 10 record, all have to be reasons why Zeke is so motivated entering this season. The boys need the best Zeke they can get for sure. His backup Tony Pollard is entering his third NFL campaign, and at times during offseason workouts, he's lined up as a receiver. In his three seasons at Memphis, Pollard had one 104 catches for nearly 1,300 yards receiving and nine touchdowns out of the backfield. He can make things happen, which is part of the reason why the boys are experimenting with him outside. It's just, you know, a matter of guys, you know, being banged up, a few guys not being there, and um, them just wanting to see my uh, versatility and being able to make plays, you know, all over the field, whether it running back, slot, or wherever. Rookie cornerback Hoban Joseph was all smiles, signing his first contract today, a four-year deal. He was picked in the second round, number 44 overall. He missed part of OTAs because he was in a 10-day quarantine per head coach Mike McCarthy. The Houston Texans currently have eight running backs on their roster, including Philip Lindsay, who signed with the Denver Broncos as an undrafted free agent in 2018. In three seasons with the Broncos, he rushed for more than 2,500 yards, topping 1,000 yards each of his first two seasons. Standing 5'8 at 190 pounds, Lindsay is not afraid to run inside. It's a mentality, you know, uh, growing up, that's what I've learned. Uh, if you want to be a running back, you got to be able to run inside, inside out. And that's just how I take my game. I know how to run inside. I can run outside. And I just want to put everything together and be an all around running back this year. Um, but yeah, like I, I make my money inside and I know that I have the speed to, to be outside. So for me, uh, it's just about getting comfortable with these, with the plays, uh, get familiar with, with the offensive line and just be explosive. Lindsey suffered a toe injury last season in week one and missed six games, which kept his numbers down. Dave Campbell's Texas Football Magazine revealed its 2021 preseason All-Texas College team and the Aggies of Texas A&M lead the way with 10 honorees, six on the first team, four on the second team. Defensive lineman DeMarvin Leal made the first team and was also named the best college D lineman in Texas. DeMarvin registered 37 total tackles his sophomore season with seven tackles for loss, two and a half sacks, eight quarterback hits, two forced fumbles and one fumble recovered. The all Texas teams, <coughs> excuse me, include 52 student athletes from all 12 FBS schools in the state of Texas, along with the rare FCS player who made the cut. Plus four San Antonio guys made that list. UTSA running backs and Sierra McCormick, UTSA offensive lineman Spencer Burford and the Aggies to Marvin Leal all made the first team. Since Sear was named the best college running back in Texas and Leal the top defensive lineman in the state. UTSA DB Rashad Wisdom and Roadrunners punter Lucas Dean were both named at a second team. Wisdom, Leal McCormick went to Judson High School and Burford is from Wagner. So representing out there in the Judson area. A lot of yeah. local talent. Yes. Yeah. Thanks, Larry. You got it. We'll be right back. We are seeing a lot of pop up clinics that are happening across the community and again a lot of questions from viewers on exactly what is a Delta variant. What about being pregnant and getting the vaccine and as we usually do on Thursdays, we are pleased to be joined by Dr. Ruth Bergeron from the Long School of Medicine at UT Health San Antonio to help answer some of those questions. I know right now you're at one of those pop up clinics. We've got a lot we want to get to, but quickly, what are you seeing there and how's turnout been so far? Well, we're here with UT Health uh, physicians and students, and we're vaccinating in the parking lot of the Now Word Covenant Church. And I'm pleased to see a brisker turnout today than we had when we were here three weeks ago. Most people are here tonight getting their second shot, but we've had a number of people show up for their first vaccine. And what I'm seeing, Steve, to your question, is young folks. I'm seeing kids that are recently out of school and that are looking forward to their summertime activities, maybe a summer job. And so these are the um, 12 to 18 age set. Um, seeing a lot of them tonight. 
We want to get to some of these viewer questions, especially a topic that we get a lot of questions about continuously getting the COVID-19 vaccine when you are pregnant. A viewer wrote into us asking how many weeks into pregnancy is it safe to be vaccinated? So the answer is any time during pregnancy. There is not a time cutoff that you must wait for to have safety in vaccination. And we know this from multiple clinical trials that are ongoing and from the original set of clinical trials where some people got pregnant um, despite having been told not to because they were in a clinical trial. And the exciting news is that there seems to be no adverse events at all. There, is, there are no uh, bad pregnancy outcomes. There are no worse side effects for the moms. So you do not have to wait to a certain time point in your pregnancy to get the vaccine. And I don't know that it can be said enough. We've determined through our case ad Q&A and through our questions with you, there is no evidence that these, these vaccines cause infertility. Right, not at all. And if that were the case, we would have seen, we wouldn't have seen any pregnancies in the, in the Pfizer vaccine trial, right? But people got pregnant even when they were told not to get pregnant. So clearly uh, it's not impeding their fertility, but there, there are plenty of data um, that not only show that the vaccine is safe in pregnancy for the mom and the baby, there are plenty of data that show that the vaccine is not causing any impairment of fertility. So that is a myth that we really need to put to rest. We're hearing a lot more about this Delta variant of COVID-19 and how the vaccines may be holding up to that. Tell us what we need to know about this strain. So Delta variant is the name that's now been given to the variant that was seen or has been seen in India. It's got multiple mutations and these mutations are causing the virus to be much more infectious, up to 60% more transmissible by some estimates and possibly more lethal, although we have less data about that. And it's also very important for us here in the United States because while our vaccines are going to protect us against the Delta variant, they're not quite as effective. And if you've only had one shot of your two shots, your protection against Delta variant is only 33%. Okay, got that? One shot is only 33% effective against this variant. And you need to get your second shot uh, in order to have 88% protection. So that's a little lower than the protection we were getting from the other strains or the earlier strains. Now, the Delta variant has arrived in the United States, and we're told that more than 6% of the viruses being sequenced in the U.S. right now are this Delta strain. And Delta has taken over as the main variant in the United Kingdom, um, which everybody remember had the UK variant. Well, the UK variant gave way to this Delta variant over there. And um, the U our, our first uh, wave of virus gave way to the UK variant here. So we fully expect that we're gonna see Delta taking hold. In fact, this week it was reported in Houston. Houston Methodist has been sequencing and has over 20 cases of the Delta variant. So it's in Texas. And um, what this means is everybody needs to really get vaccinated. Is there a concern that even if you're vaccinated, that this could mutate in a way that the vaccines may not be effective? So, yes, I mean, I want to give you the good news, bad news. You know, the good news is that even with this nasty variant called the Delta variant, if you've been fully vaccinated, you have about 88% protection. That's not as good as 94, 95% protection. You know, the bad news is that if this variant takes hold in the unvaccinated population, which it easily could, and which is roughly half of our population in the United States, it could wreak havoc in that group, uh, just as it has elsewhere in the world. We have heard of some stories of people going out to get antibody tests after they've gotten the vaccine to try to test the effectiveness of the vaccine. So some questions about what that really means, if it's useful. So could a negative antibody test after getting the vaccine mean that the vaccine was not effective? So I strongly recommend people don't go get antibody tests because there's really nothing you're gonna do differently with managing your care going forward. And there are a variety of different kinds of antibody tests that are available on the market, and they do not necessarily correlate with protection. So when you read in the news about neutralizing antibody titers, that's a very, very specific research kind of test that's looking for a very specific kind of antibody that's knocking out the virus. 
And that is not the same test that's being applied by these commercial companies that are testing for the antibodies. The only thing this test that you have access to is good for is maybe telling you whether that illness you had a few weeks ago was probably COVID or not. It says nothing about whether the vaccine that you got is protecting you or it isn't. And so it will not change what you do going forward. This came up recently for me. I, I had a question from a patient um, who wanted to know, uh, he has an immunocompromising situation and he wanted to know if the fact that he has no antibodies uh, means that he should do something different or get revaccinated. And we have no guidelines and no science and no data to direct us to tell people to get vaccinated again if they didn't make antibodies. What I will say is that there are groups of people that are gonna still be more vulnerable. And those include the really old, so people over the age of 80, people that have had solid organ transplant, or people who take medications that suppress their immune system for other reasons. Those folks are not gonna be as well protected, and so they need to wear their masks. But getting an antibody test is just going to make people feel anxious and it's not going to let us know really what to do about it. Dr. Ruth Bergen with the Long School of Medicine at UT Health San Antonio. As always, we appreciate your time and your expertise. Thank you. Come out and get vaccinated. We're vaccinating now. We'll see you next time. We'll be right back. Welcome back, everybody. Still have some issues out there on the roads uh, this evening, including on I-35 and now on 1604. But we're also going to stop quickly on the north side. A rollover here reported at Blanco at Wurzbach Parkway. So watch out uh, for that uh, this afternoon and this evening. A new crash here. This is 1604 southbound at Petrenko. The exit ramp is closed off. We can show you that here on the trans guide. You see the ramp there closed off. Uh, Falcon Wolf Dove Canyon. You can see uh, the traffic uh, backed up there. And let's check 35 one more time before we toss it back over to Stephen Meyer. You see still some delays southbound. Things are improving. Also, that I 10 crash we told you about earlier, Stephen Meyer, that is starting to clear out as well. All right, good to hear. Thanks, Samuel. You know what I heard today in the newsroom that I have not heard in a while, uh, Myra? Uh, uh oh. What was that? The Canyon. Cascarone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. De El, Cascarone. El Canyon de Cascarone. Well, I knew I couldn't say it the way you said it, so that's why I just decided, you know, <laughs> he's getting ready for next Thursday, basically. Oh, I bet he is. I got a lot of confetti. Are you ready for some confetti? Because this week's going to be picked up by Doppler radar during Fiesta Fiesta <laughs> this time next week. 90 right now. We'll be down in the 80s this evening. We'll talk about when rain chances return in a good drought monitor comparison. Coming right up. It's nice to have Fiesta and confetti to talk about because it seems like we are <laughs> settling into summer. It also seems like it's been so long <laughs> since we've talked about Fiesta and actually it's it right around the corner and you know, I don't know if I'm ready. Oh, that's, that's the way I feel. Ready. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I feel ill prepared. Yeah, just yeah. it's because it's it's June and it's not a full fiesta. We don't have all the parades and such, but we're still going to party. <laughs> we're still going to make it rain some confetti. All right, speaking of rain, we did, we've done very well, of course, in the rainfall department over the past couple of months since late April when the skies opened up. This is six weeks ago, our drought monitor. Too much red. We don't like that red. Well, <laughs> look at today. Yes. Pretty much all of the drought wiped away from Central and South Texas and now we're in good shape, at least for now, because we are <laughs> starting to approach our dry season. And speaking of dry, West Texas still very dry, just particularly about five counties out there. Alpine, Marfa, Marathon area down toward Big Bend National Park as well. Uh, this is where we need the rain. and. We had some showers pop up in this area yesterday. We still need more. Let's talk about lake levels because they really didn't respond as much as I think a lot of people would assume from the from the rainfall. Medina Lake in particular, that reservoir, very small watershed. You need heavy rain in a specific spot. It's actually three feet lower than three months ago and 37 feet below the conservation pool. Canyon, usually a fairly stable water level, three feet below. That's 93% full and that is actually three feet higher than three months ago. 
So looking at the satellite and radar, a little bit of activity in Mexico around Big Bend and a few showers popped up very briefly in West Texas. That's the spot where we really need them. Even the Western Panhandle, we could use more rain and of course up into the four corners. Big Blue H though, this is in control right now. It is going to be sliding northward in the days ahead. All that does for us is put us in this northerly flow aloft and that northerly flow opens the door for a few disturbances because sometimes we get little ripples in the upper level flow, little disturbances that then drop our way. And it also opens the door for anything to come in from the Gulf of Mexico. Say there's a disturbance or even some tropical activity. There's that potential. It opens that door as well. It's when it's sitting right on top of us where there really isn't much wiggle room at that point. So starting next week, Monday afternoon, then every afternoon, 20% chance a few pop up showers or thunderstorms possible. So pretty minimal out there, at least for now. Laredo, Del Rio, 99, 97 Catula. That's another hot spot. 90 Uvalde, Hondo, Hondo, San Antonio. Dew point still in the 70s, not as oppressive at this hour as this time yesterday. A minor little improvement, but we're still feeling it. And the heat indices are just over 100 in Pleasanton. Kennedy at 100. Gonzalez feels like 102. So this evening, temperatures gradually falling through the 80s. By 10 o'clock, will be 82 degrees. Midnight, right near 80. And then tomorrow, we'll start the day in the mid-70s. By the afternoon, probably making it into the lower 90s very briefly, but it's going to feel like it's closer to 100. This weekend, we turn it up just a little bit, mid 90s for highs, so 95 degrees on Sunday. And then next week, similar temperatures, low to mid 90s with that slight chance of a few storms. <laughs> you know what that sound means? You yeah. know what that means. Oh, I've loved this weather pattern lately. Look at I was able to pop all these bulbs, you know, blow the glass for all these ones just over the past couple of days. And I've made up for some lost time. So let's announce not just one winner, two winners today. <laughs> Hannibal of San Antonio, you're the first winner of a homemade thermometer. But wait, we have another one more for you from San Antonio, Hortensia. Pre Preciado. Preciado. <laughs> yes, I actually called. I was Preciado. trying to. Yeah, anyway, I got sent you all emails and we'll be in touch about picking them up. But yes, this is good. I like being able to catch up on my inventory. Two thermometer winners, a drought monitor. We are packing a lot of excitement I, into a Thursday. I am frankly surprised the jingle jangle of newly made <laughs> thermometers isn't your ringtone. <laughs> my ringtone is actually my kids when they're younger. It's their giggle. Ah, well, wow. there you that go. can go off in church and nobody notices. It's great. That is genius. <laughs> Not that I have it on in church. OK, I turn it off, but uh -huh. say it could. Yeah. Hypothetically speaking, you've <laughs> given yourself away. Yeah. <laughs> so there, sorry, Father Tony. <laughs> in case you missed it, coming up next. Here's today's in case you missed it. It is Thursday, June 10th. For nearly 16 years, Mark Outing's restaurant has operated across from the Friedrich complex. A developer has been working to turn a non-historic portion of the complex into a 358 unit housing development called the Friedrich Lofts. About half of the units would be reserved for people earning 60 or 80% of the area median income, or AMI. 80% of the people who live in the area won't be able to afford to live there. An advisory panel deciding whether to recommend COVID shots for kids younger than 12. They're also working to determine if mRNA vaccines, Pfizer and Moderna, are linked to a higher than expected number of cases of myocarditis and pericarditis in teens, which can cause heart inflammation. I will announce next week the plan for the state of Texas to begin building the border wall in the state of Texas. Governor Greg Abbott making that very announcement in Del Rio just moments ago this evening, talking about plans he has to address the surge of migrants we've seen recently along the U.S.-Mexico border, including signing an executive order. One person has been arrested in connection with an apartment complex fire that left 20 people without a home this evening. The flames sparked just before four this morning at the Bricks Terrell Hills Apartments. That's off Harry Wurzbach Road, not far from Riddiman and Eisenhower Road. When fire crews got there, they say they saw heavy flames coming from the roof of the building. Part of that roof collapsed. A tenant there says this was a scary morning.
Things greatly improving on the roads, but still some delays on 35 coming out of New Braunfels. Take you 39 minutes to get to Loop 410. We're also monitoring the situation still here on Loop 1604 at Petrenko. They have cleared uh, the main lanes right now following this rollover crash. So if you're traveling uh, in that area, that area, that is something to uh, watch out for this evening. But again, uh, now if you need to head out, things are looking much better out there, Adam. All right, and weather-wise, pretty repetitive. You'll have some clouds in the morning, then a lot of sunshine tomorrow afternoon. We'll start the day in the mid-70s. Later on, low 90s. This weekend, fairly sunny once we shake free from those morning clouds, but they're not going to last as long. And I do think we'll get into the mid-90s, especially by Sunday. Next week, we could see some pop-up afternoon thunder showers, especially closer to the Gulf Coast. But even locally, it can't be rolled out. It's just a 20% chance. That's what we're looking at. Those are the changes into next week. So nothing major, just some minor tweaks and fluctuations in terms of temperatures next week. As for tomorrow, a little closer look across our area. I do think we'll be hitting the century marker, at least very close to it along the Rio Grande, Del Rio, Eagle Pass, uh, Carrizo Springs and Catula, but low 90s in San Antonio. Temperatures creeping up. Thanks, Adam. And thanks for watching the news at six. See you back here on the night beat at 10.